testing your Postgres backups, um, a practical guide. Uh, my name is Nick Meyer, and uh, let's get started with uh, Welcome to Pasadena. It's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty fun place. Um, it's been about six years or so since I've lived here full time, but I do enjoy coming back here quite a bit. Um, you know, I can't point to any specific reason why I'd say it's probably mostly just uh, nostalgia. Uh, speaking of which, you know, nostalgia, it, it has this way of being this contagious social phenomenon, like especially nostalgia around like the Roman Empire, if you've heard any of that, whether it's on social media or similar, um, you know, alongside it, there tends to go this narrative that uh, we just don't build things like we used to. Uh, we had this you know, there's this notion that there's this ancient knowledge that we have lost, that, you know, we have these, we have these ancient structures with Roman concrete, uh, Roman roads, and yet somehow engineers nowadays, you know, we can't build things that last more than a few decades, and yet this stuff has lasted several millennia. Uh, so what's up with that? And perhaps some of you are, uh, you know, maybe you just walked in or maybe you tuned out for a moment and maybe some of you are wondering, okay, wait, what, what is going on here? Who is this person who's talking in front of me right now? You know, did, did he introduce himself? Where, where were his title slides? I thought this was supposed to be a talk about Postgres backups. And if you're in that boat, don't worry. Um, I promise you, you're in the right talk. Uh, we'll get to all of that shortly. I just wanted to start out with this analogy in order to explain to you all, you know, upfront what this talk is not going to be. Uh, in this talk, I will not tell you or give you some uh, conception that I know everything there is to know about backups and that I'm just an expert, you know, an ab the end all be all expert at backups, uh, because that's not true. I am not going to tell you that uh, my employer or I have, you know, formulated a perfect backup testing strategy that will leave you fully confident, risk-free, and I'm certainly not gonna tell you that we've never made mistakes. Uh, and you know, the reason I bring up this analogy of the Roman Empire in the first place is that if we want to, if we want to replicate success, you know, in order to do that, we can't just look at examples of what people have done and found success. We don't know necessarily whether that success was just due to luck, we don't know you know, what they tried that didn't work. And often, you know, a common theme I've found, uh, certainly like in my experience with Postgres backups, uh, but you know, I think it applies pretty generally, is that a lot of the time what we learn the most from is failure, from things that don't work out. And I'm hoping to give you all sort of a taste of like both sides of that coin uh, from my personal experience. Uh, speaking of which, you know, you know some uh, introductions are in order, uh, so, who do I work for? Uh, Academia.edu, who are we? Uh, we are an organization whose mission is to ensure that every paper ever written is available on the internet, available there to read for free online. Uh, more broadly, what our goal is, is to accelerate the world's research. Uh, and you know, to go into some of our successes, if you will, or some stats at least pointing towards our progress towards those goals so far, we have about 47 million papers on our site uh, that have been uploaded, depending on how you do the rounding. Uh, let's say that we think there's about 100 million papers that have ever been written um, in the academic world. It's a constantly moving target. So maybe we're about like 50% of the way there. Um, on, the th on the theme of accelerating the world's research, uh, there's a common story in academic publishing where someone will publish a paper and it gets read maybe by three people total, give or take. Uh, one read by reviewer number one, um, another read by reviewer number two. You know, you probably see where this is going. Reviewer number three is the final person to ever glance at that paper, and that's just the way it is. And at least, let, let me put it this way, there's a lot of research out there that deserves better than that. And from the perspective of the world, you know, if this is impactful research that can make a difference in people's lives and in our understanding of the world, uh, the world deserves better than that. And you know, to that point, uh, we 
we have been addressing that problem to the tune of 20 million paper recommendations per day, making sure it actually gets read by the right people. OK, but this is a Postgres talk. I should probably give you a little bit of context on what we're working with. Uh, particularly, this is a talk about backups. Maybe I should answer the question up front. What, you know, what is our scale? What size of data are we backing up? Uh, because this probably has some implications for, you know, if you are at a different scale than us, whether that's three orders of magnitude larger or three orders of magnitude smaller, maybe you'll need to make some adjustments. Um, we have about 100 terabytes of data, if I round super aggressively, distributed across 15 independent different clusters, um, entirely on AWS. And no matter how you slice it, it's about half and half between um, Aurora RDS and our older self-managed uh, EC2 instance uh, clusters. Um, you know, one for a variety of reasons, HA uh, never-ending need for high, uh, you know, high read throughput in our workloads. We have tons of read-only replicas, um, and you know, getting to like the team size, since I think this is pretty relevant too. This is a practical guide. It's about balancing all the things you want to do with all the things you actually can achieve in practice. We have maybe about 50 engineers total across the entire organization. Uh, divide that in 10 for people more on the uh, infrastructure side of things. Uh, speaking of which, who am I? Uh, hi, my name is Nick Meyer. Um, I have my GitHub link there. Uh, we have to go even earlier than the Romans to the Greeks uh, for Aristocrates. So imagine you take Aristotle and Socrates and mash them together into uh, Aristocrates. Sounds a little uh, pretentious too, like an aristocrat or something. Um, but yeah, uh, who am I uh, at Academia? I'm currently the team lead of our platform engineering team. Uh, my areas of focus uh, on that team have included uh, the developer experience, uh, the kind of the interface between our application layer where our, the rest of the develop engineering organization works and our infrastructure layer. Um, and because, you know, as I mentioned before, we're not like the largest uh, engineering team in the world, uh, there are some interesting staffing trade-offs which result in the data layer and Postgres in particular being parts of my, uh, you know, daily, uh, daily work. And in particular, uh, speaking of Postgres and Postgres backups, uh, allow me to introduce you to Academia's old Postgres backup solution. Um, you may have heard the advice at some point uh, in your life, never roll your own backup system. Um, allow me to introduce you to a Ruby script. All right, it's not as bad as it sounds. It, it was a Ruby script wrapping PG base backup, if you've heard of that tool um, in Postgres. Uh, but even so, I would say that like, there, there is more to worry about than just the absolute lowest level. It's still, it's still, I'd say, not the greatest idea. So, you know, one thing that is really nice about this is it was a great way to learn about backups and all the things that would go, you know, the, all the things that could go wrong with them. Uh, I learned a lot having to maintain the script and ultimately, you know, replacing it with PG Backrest, uh, if you've heard of that tool. Uh, much nicer, inter much nicer in a lot of things than that tool was. Um, so, you know, a great learning experience, but otherwise a bad idea. I would not recommend this. Um, a little bit on the note of this being a practical guide. I think that as, as an engineering organization who has, that has made mistakes, and as an engineering organization that doesn't have like the staffing to do everything that we'd wanna do, um, my goal is to cut out a lot of the noise because a lot of times, what is just as important as what we choose to do is what we choose not to do because it's not worth it or it just doesn't pass that trade-off muster. Um, but you know, I, w I don't wanna give you the impression that we've only ever made mistakes. I do think that one reason that why, one reason why we're still here today with our data, you know, more or less mostly intact um, as it was intended to be is because we stumbled almost inadvertently onto a pretty solid backup testing strategy. Um, I don't think that we were particularly intentional about how we came about this. I think that we ended up stumbling upon it due to mostly business reasons. Um, and I'd love to share that with you today. So to sum it in short, although I'm not gonna be able to teach you all in 45 minutes, give or take, all the things I learned from having to maintain that Ruby script and fix things when things were broken. Um, experience may be the best teacher. Hopefully, 
this talk is gonna be a slightly more cost-effective teacher for all of you so that you don't need to uh, go through all those stressful moments yourselves firsthand. Um, okay, so I think that it would be useful to have a little bit of structure for this talk just so I don't go on more tangents about the Roman Empire history or uh, similar things like that. Uh, so I'm gonna flip the order still a little bit of the order of like what I talk about here. So I'm gonna actually start with the why. Like why do we have backups? That that sounds like a pretty, that sounds like a question with a pretty obvious answer. But you know, if we were to formalize like what are the, what, what are the problems we're actually trying to address more rigorously with backups? Uh, then after that I'm gonna get into the how, starting with you know, what, what is this strategy that I've alluded to? Like how do we test them? Uh, but also how do we set measurable goals that can be quantified around backups? How do we monitor them? Uh, you know, part one of that is, let's get enough context on how backups work so we know what to monitor, and then how do we actually do that? Uh, so let us get started with this thought experiment of what could go wrong. So let's say we have, let's call it a high availability setup of some sort. Um, you know, we don't have all the information here, but just trust me for now. Uh, we have, you know, a writer node, uh, we have some, read-only replicas following it. Uh, we've even thought a little bit about eliminating some obvious single points of failure that there might be in a setup like this. Such as, for instance, uh, you know, to use like Amazon Cloud regions, we've split up the regions so that they're not all in one region. Um, you know, side note, we don't actually do this. This was a little on the expensive side for us with data transfer fees and such. But you know, let, let's like make the, let's really steel man this example of this several node setup where suppose we don't have any backups yet. Um, okay, so maybe we think we've addressed like, what if all nodes go down? We don't think that's likely because the world has bigger problems if US West 2 and US East 1 are both down concurrently. Uh, you know, a question we might ask is what if some nodes go down? Does the application know how to handle that? Are there errors? Do things work? Have we tested it? Have we thought about it? Um, but you know, maybe like a bigger, point of concern I would bring up with this is our good old friend uh, drop table users or delete from users. Uh, what if that gets run in the wrong environment? Okay, so maybe some of you are thinking like, okay, th this, is, this is a problem that other people would face at other organizations. You know, we have stricter controls in place uh, than, we, we, we have strict enough controls in place that like there's just no way a dev would think they're connected in one environment but actually be connected in another. But you know, the question I'd pose to you is, do you, do you really trust your automation that much? Is it like, you know, seriously, what, what, is, what is the control in place there, like at a, at a higher conceptual level? Like is, it, is there some place somewhere where a string might just get mixed up one place and this can get routed to the wrong location? So you know, I, I've seen some pretty crazy stuff that I'm not gonna get into. Uh, but you know, I think that like we, at the very least, if we care enough about our data to have backups, then we should care enough about our data to want it to be, you know, we, we, should, we should want some safeguards or some, some options or recourse if this were to happen. And the problem with this setup is that uh, this, this DML just replicates immediately to these replicas under our current setup. Uh, maybe some of you are thinking, okay, but like there, we may or may not be aware that like there's a way to have delayed replicas with Postgres. Maybe we can put a six hour delay on just one just in case. Um, I feel like that's kind of fallen out of favor in the modern day, you know, cause like what if, you do, what if we don't notice for one millisecond after that amount of time? You know, I've, I've definitely seen cases where there's been data loss on systems other than Postgres, let's just leave it at that, um, that we didn't notice for a day and just had to recalculate. Um, okay, so, all right, all right. You've convinced me or I, I've convinced myself, I've convinced you hopefully we should have backups. I'm not gonna define exactly what that means yet or go into the details of how that works, but there's some notion how, let, let's just say we're gonna be sending some sort of copy of what's on Postgres. Uh, could be from the writer, maybe from something else, to S3, just to keep the example within Amazon Cloud. If you, you know, if that doesn't apply to your organization, just kind of translate in your head whether that's a hard drive on some other computer somewhere else or an equivalent for some other cloud. Um, but you know, we're still left with this question. What do we actually do if, you know, let's say a disaster does happen. We, you know, we're supposedly prepared. We have a backup, a node goes down. Uh, what, what actually happens at this point? And that brings me to, you know, 
my first major point I'd like to make here, which is that we don't care about backups. We do not because we care about restores, not backups. Um, with that, I'm gonna let that simmer a bit as I take a sip of water. All right, so what, what, what is our actual goal? Like what is our purpose with taking backups? Because if they're write only, if they're just this write only thing that we never use, then we're just wasting money on them probably. Um, I'm gonna say that what we want with backups is there is some point in time where the data layer was in some state and we want the capability to be able to restore our Postgres layer to whatever that state was, um, you know, and we, furthermore, we want it to be sufficiently decorrelated with other, with whatever is running Postgres, that if Postgres were to completely disappear, we would still expect the backup to exist. We'd still expect it to be usable. Um, so, you know, maybe a question we have is, what exactly are we restoring? Uh, we can have different goals here. For instance, we might want the capability to restore just anything that was ever written, or, you know, to the greatest extent possible, targeting that as our North Star, so to speak. Or maybe there's some other use cases. For instance, we need to audit something that happened a week ago. Uh, we need to, for some compliance reason, look at something, look at like some row that was present in some table a month ago, but has since been deleted. Um, so maybe like in the past 30 to 60 days, we have reasons to look at it. Other reasons might be like corruption, like there's some problem with our data now, but we're pretty confident it was okay in the past. It's always good to like have, have it as an option, the ability to at least like peek at it. Um, another thing I'd mention is restores need to be fast enough to be useful. Uh, I'm not gonna define exactly what that means in clock time because that is obviously a pretty, that's, that's pretty dependent on like what your workload is, what your business requirements are, what, you know, what your data size is. Uh, I would not hold a 15 terabyte database to the same standard as, you know, a 20 gigabyte database. But generally speaking, like, you know, with most of our workloads, like bringing it back to kind of like, what do we think, how do we think of this at academia? We want to be able to replace like a node that fails within hours, not days. All right, so we went over what might go wrong if we don't have any backups. Um, let's say we have backups though, and let's say that we are appropriately concerned with restores. Um, allow me to introduce you to the concept of Schrodinger's backup, which we may be familiar with, um, or maybe we're familiar with the cat. Uh, this isn't Schrodinger's cat, this is Schrodinger's backup. Uh, Schrodinger's backup, a little bit similarly to the cat, states that the condition of any backup is unknown until a restore is attempted. Now. So, okay, I, 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 don't, I don't know if like this forum, Spotlight on IT series number 212 in 2013, I don't know if that was actually the first uh, reference of this, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical, it seems, but you know, it was the earliest reference I was able to find on the internet. Um, but you know, furthermore, beyond that, maybe, maybe some of us are thinking that's a little bit, this is a little bit too strict, like maybe, is it really, is it really not possible to just kind of glance at it? Like let's say it's an S3, there's a file browser that you can use in your, there's a file viewer you can just view in your browser. You can take a look at it kind of by eye. Uh, what, are, what, are, what are some specific reasons why that might not be enough? Like whether we implement other monitoring or whatnot. Um, so allow me to introduce you to some actual backup failures, if you will, that I have seen in prod. All right, well, let's do the easy case first. Uh, backups just weren't happening. A lot of the time, uh, the way that backups are taken in Postgres will, you know, there, there will be a component of it at least that looks kind of like cron, um, whether it's a cron job or something that's kind of isomorphic to that. Um, it's probably like a problem we can all appreciate, like maybe whatever's supposed to be scheduling some operation to happen just isn't actually happening for some reason or another. Um, maybe that's easy enough to check, like you just, look that a file is actually in the destination and maybe it's there, maybe it's not. Okay, but leveling up a little bit to, let's say a stage two enemy, um, you know, stage two boss fight, successful backups, we have metadata or some exit status or some 
indication of success that is telling us that this backup was taken, uh, self-reported by the system that's responsible for taking it, of course, but actually it's just an empty file. Uh, what, now, what, what are some sort of things that might cause this? Um, well, this particular instance, if you're familiar with the concept of pipe fail, uh, this Ruby script that I alluded to earlier, uh, that our backup solution used to be, effectively piped the output of PG base backup to standard out, piped that into gzip, then piped that to S3, you know, more or less with a little bit of, not exactly how it worked, but conceptually that was pretty much it. And if you don't remember to check like the exit status of every single step in that chain, you end up with the last step receiving nothing because something earlier has failed. The last step thinks that it succeeded. It has successfully compressed the empty string and successfully sent it to its destination. Um, and that's how you get an empty file uh, that is supposedly a complete backup. Um, and then level three boss fight. A backup, you know, we definitely know it's not an empty file. There's stuff there. It looks pretty good, but if you attempt to restore from it, Postgres, it says it's starting. Three hours later, it still says it's starting. Um, I'm not gonna like bore you with the details. It never finished starting. Um, I'll touch a little bit on what might cause that later. So basically, um, basically the, the, reason why, the reason why I invoke the concept of Schrodinger's backup is that if we really are worried about all three of these, and I've seen all of these happen, the only way that you catch every one of these is if you actually attempt a, you attempt a restore of a particular backup and then you see it work. That is the only way that you can defeat that level three boss fight, so to speak. Okay, so some additional things that I am not going to talk about today because I only have 45 minutes, maybe like half of that at this point. Uh, ransomware, data corruption, insider threats, a common theme along, you know, among these concepts is that I mentioned that we wanna restore the data layer to what it once was. Uh, this is kind of challenging the assumption that that's even something that we'd wanna do. Like maybe, maybe that state that has been persisted into our backups is actually bad in some way and we need some additional layers of defense beyond what we have with backups. Um, I think of backups as, I think of backups and like backup testing and restore testing. I think of this as a solid foundation on which we can build later to a more thorough uh, data security posture, if you will. But um, you could have a full talk on each of these. All right, so how do we test restores? Um, we're perhaps familiar with the Swiss cheese model, but if we're not, just to, or, you know, just to give a brief recap, uh, the idea is um, in there, we have these red arrows that are representing something bad happening. We have these layers of Swiss cheese. Uh, sometimes the arrows pass through a hole in the cheese. Sometimes they get blocked. Think of every layer of Swiss cheese here as some defensive measure we've put in place to prevent something bad from happening. Each individual uh, control that we've put in place is imperfect. Some things we just know we'll get through. But the idea is if we stack enough layers of cheese in front of the adversary, uh, hopefully if things are sufficiently decorrelated between layers, hopefully nothing will actually get through every single one of them. It just takes one to block it, that's the idea. All right, so what is part one of this strategy for testing your restores? Um, so motivated by this business need uh, at Academia where we need a lot of read capacity, uh, we churn through a lot of replicas as a result of that, is every time you need a new replica, you should use your backups. Uh, so you know, what this looks like is you restore from S3, and then importantly, you know, connect it to, connect it to your cluster through streaming replication as step two, once that restore finishes. Um, and then one nice thing about like this part of the strategy is when your backups break, uh, for one thing, you'll notice at least as frequently as you need to bring up a new replica. And secondly, fixing this, you know, fixing the situation is actually gonna be a priority. It's not just going to end up on a JIRA backlog somewhere as a nice to fix. Um, it'll actually be blocking, you know, a business need. And then, Okay, so part two of the strategy to layer on an additional layer of Swiss cheese in our uh, Swiss cheese model. Um, something that often comes up for us is we need prod realistic data when testing certain operations. That might be an upgrade. Uh, it might be something as simple as just like a big batch of you know data manipulation that someone needs to do. Uh, 
we often have a need to have benchmarks for that. How long is it going to take? Does it break things? Uh, we need to QA it. And in order to get prod realistic data in that staging environment, uh, we've needed to create tooling to bring up a copy of prod in staging. And what I'm saying here is uh, you should also use your backups for that. Uh, this is similarly, you know, maybe you promote it right away so it might not stay a replica, but effectively, you know, falls under that case one. You need, you need a new copy of some database. You restore from your backups. And the additional, like, marginal benefit this is adding on top of that previous point is that you're really confirming that you can restore from nothing. Um, you're confirming that there isn't some sort of pollution of data that is leaking in from that point where you connect it to the writer. Um, there's some guides online that are great when you're getting started, but um, kind of bypass this, where you just take a base backup live from some node that's running, and then you uh, connect things up. And to be honest, we have that code path. So this is, we have that code path, and you know, it's a fear of mine sometimes that we'll inadvertently revert to that and not notice that our backups are broken. Uh, so this part two really like ensures that if you at least do this sometimes, you're, you're confirming that you haven't like flipped the Boolean in that direction, so to speak. Okay, so everything else on top of this, I'm gonna say is an optimization, you know, another layer of Swiss cheese, so to speak. That's not to say that optimizations are not important. Um, I just think that like these are the two most important things, in my opinion, to do for testing your backups or restores rather, if you're not doing it right now. So maybe a question we have is, how often? How about at least once in the lifetime of your database? Um, that's certainly a good start. Okay, so you know, to be to be like a little more serious here, you know, I'll, I'll give you the bad news. I don't, I don't think that there is a specific threshold after which you know you're bad, you're in a bad place before, and you're all good to go. You know, even even if you're testing every single backup, like how do you know that? something hasn't gone wrong with a backup. You know, technically you'd need to just continually be testing restores every millisecond to be confident. Uh, but you know, my, my rough rule of thumb is like, if, if the integrity of your backups is keeping you up at night, find wherever you are on the left-hand side of this chart and level up at least by one, going to the right-hand side. So if you've never done this before, now is the time to do it once. Or if you've only done it once, maybe now's the time to do it on some periodic interval, like once a year, or once a quarter, once a month, and so on. Uh, the more you test it, you know, the more often you test it, the more confidence you can have in your backups. And furthermore, uh, you know, although Schrodinger's backup technically is always going to be, is always gonna be something that weighs on the back of our mind, like we don't really know if this backup works if we don't attempt to use it, if we don't attempt to restore from it. Uh, the more frequently you test this, you know, the more frequently you test these things, the more confident you can be that they work in general, even if you don't literally test everyone. And you know, one, one last thing I wanna say about this before moving on is that I've seen this, you know, I've seen this strategy deliver value even if you're just doing this at a frequency of roughly, you know, once a year or once every couple of years. Like you still, you know, the most important thing is just that you do this at least once. You know, you, you will still catch problems, you will still fix them. Okay, so a side note, I noticed that we were, I noted earlier that we were 50% on Aurora, 50% on EC2 instances. Um, just to like kind of emphasize this uh, on, the, on the theme of like one size does not fit all with the frequency since honestly like the, honestly like the frequency at which you test these probably depends on your business needs, probably depends on your budget for provisioning new instances. Uh, we generally trust Amazon to know what they're doing with backups, um, it's managed for us, you know, provided that we've configured it correctly. And so we, we test, you know, we go through this procedure much less, much less frequency, much less uh, frequently with managed databases than we do with our self-managed self -managed databases on EC2 instances. Uh, just, you know, in a Bayesian sense, our prior is that we like, we just trust our own stuff a little bit less than uh, these managed databases. Okay. So getting further, moving further along into the how, uh, what goals should we set? How do we quantify, you know, are all backups created equal? No, but how do, how do we like weigh them against each other? How do we say one backup is better than another? How do we put that into numbers? 
Um, allow me to introduce to you the concepts of the recovery point objective and the recovery time objective. So recovery point objective is really answering the question like how much data loss is tolerable. Um, we put a number on that. And what uh, the recovery time objective is answering is the question how long is tolerable until, you know, what is tolerable for the answer to the question, how long until we're back? Like a disaster happens and we need to come back. And I think these are best illustrated with timeline, you know, in graphical form with timelines. Uh, so let's say uh, we have a recovery point objective of four hours of data loss. Uh, that's what's considered acceptable. And suppose we decide that that means we should be taking backups. Let's assume for the sake of this that they act effectively as snapshots in one point in time every four hours. Um, so we can see a problem with this pretty much right away in that, let's say there's a disaster right now, um, you know, outage starting right now at 2 a.m., our last backup is at 10 p.m. Um, we have data loss of four hours, so it's not great that we're just barely achieving um, that objective of four hours of data loss. Uh, we also have an outage ongoing until this gets fixed. So um, illustrated on this graph, this is us just barely achieving our recovery point objective of four hours, yay us. And the recovery time objective illustrated here is, you know, that end-to-end -end time starting at the moment that a disaster happens and we need to restore, ending at the time where everything is back to normal, albeit with some data loss up to what we defined as acceptable in our recovery point objective. Uh, that is, you know, that is the recovery time we're achieving. And suppose for sake of argument, we're also just barely meeting a recovery time objective of four hours. Uh, that's what this would look like here. All right, point in time recovery. Uh, is this idea like we, you know, that idea I mentioned earlier about uh, we need to audit something that happened in the past. Uh, maybe there's some specific snapshot that we'd like to restore to, uh, whether it's Friday, Sunday, um, or maybe some points in between. Is that even possible? I'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, but that's the idea of point in time recovery is what points in, what points in time in between when we're taking our backups can we restore to? Um, so, you know, some specific numbers that we target, let's, let's take a hypothetical database that's roughly 15 terabytes large, um, may or may not be uh, modeled after an actual one that we have. Uh, our recovery point objective is we're targeting, uh, well, we wanna be able to restore everything with an allowance of several seconds to several minutes for, um, you know, just an allow a small allowance. I'll touch on like how that's possible later. Like, is that even possible? Do you have to take backups every single second? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, recovery time objective of about like six hours or so to restore a copy of the data um, multiplied by three if we actually need to do a cold restore and with point in time recovery um, as an option for one month and continuous points in between. Okay, so maybe I should touch a little bit along, all, along the lines of how backups work since I've gone a little bit out of order here. Um, there are some concepts that should probably be introduced to, for that recovery point objective I mentioned to make a little bit more sense. Um, word of warning before we begin though, is that this is not intended as a guide on how to roll your own backup system. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were, you know, you could say that we were kind of rolling our own backup system. We were wrapping a trusted, you know, trusted tooling, at least in some contexts, Ruby script wrapping uh, PG base backup, but we're not gonna go in depth enough to replicate um, all of these other tools that we may have heard of, such as PG Backrest, Barman, WallG, et cetera. Um, our goal really here is to know enough information that we know what to monitor. We know how to test our restores, we know how to monitor our restores. Uh, so to touch on the difference between physical, you know, the physical regime and the, the logical realm. Uh, so this, you know, applies not just to backups, but on some other levels as well. Uh, let's, let's define like what is logical um, as far as the data is concerned as like what will be seen, what is the reality that is seen by SQL clients that are connected to Postgres and running SQL commands generally. So if you do a select from users with some predicate or if you do like DML, you're modifying data, you're inserting rows, changing them, um, you know, and you're, you're avoiding some of those special columns that uh, we may have seen in some other talks uh, like the CTID or Xmin, Xmax, you know, we're just looking at the columns that we've actually defined holding our data. Um, in addition, you know, tools like PG Dump, for instance, uh, PG Dump can give you like, it can output a SQL file that just dumps out 
something that can recreate at a logical level a database, you know, your current database, if you were to load it into something that's blank. Um, but in contrast, the physical realm of Postgres is kind of what Postgres sees when it's actually looking at disk to do what Postgres does, which is effectively like mapping our data structures, mapping our tables onto what gets persisted into persistent storage. Um, and this consists of the write ahead log um, in conjunction with the data in actual files, like the ones and zeros in PG data's base directory, which I'm not gonna go into at all. Um, instead, I'm gonna give an overview of how the wall works and how that fits into backups. So um, just a quick like, recap if, you know, in case, I, I suspect like some people are familiar with wall, maybe some people aren't. Uh, the effective story of like what the write ahead log is with Postgres is that like every time you write Postgres, you know, every time you write to Postgres through a query, Postgres actually writes twice or, you know, maybe more than twice, but not to get too far into the low level details. Let's say we're like inserting into a table one row. Um, what Postgres is gonna do is firstly and secondly, um, in some order at least, it's going to persist that into its shared memory. It's going to persist it actually on disk into this append only file called the write ahead log. That happens very quickly because it's append only. Um, and then, and only then once that has happened, uh, it's going to tell the client, it's gonna to return to the client saying like, okay, I, uh, I committed that, like I, I committed the transaction. Uh, you are safe to assume that that data has actually been persisted. Um, a note on checkpointing. So checkpointing is the process by which Postgres eventually makes sure what is in its memory gets flushed in some consistent state onto its structured storage. Um, and in between the check, you know, the last checkpoint that was taken, however long ago that may have been, ideally not too long ago, but ideally for performance not too far, not too close to the present, uh, there is this string of append only write ahead log that gives us the instructions on how to recreate a consistent state of the current moment right now, even if Postgres were to crash and it needs to restart in sort of like a dirtier state than we'd like it to. Uh, and so, as a part of any physical backup system uh, that involves taking physical snapshots of whatever is on disk and structured storage, um, the write ahead log is actually a component that is not only essential for filling those gaps in between which backups you take, but it's actually, you know, on a, on a lower level of how the backups get taken, it's an essential component of taking any physical backup. So there is this uh, parameter called archive command that we may be familiar with or maybe not. Uh, but basically, uh, whenever a wall file is uh, written or you know, Postgres is done with it, uh, Postgres manages, you know, Postgres just calls this archive command, which we can configure to send it to S3. If you're using tooling like barman, wall G, uh, PG backrest, um, they'll just have configuration guides on exactly how to set this up. Uh, and so if we go back to that graph from earlier on meeting our recovery point objective, we're taking backups every four hours. That's just, you know, that's just barely enough to sometimes meet our recovery point objective. Uh, with the wall, we actually shrink that data loss window to much, much lower than uh, what we had without it. You know, and furthermore, if we think back to uh, point in time recovery, that's how we fill in the gaps between uh, the backups that we take. All right, so comparing physical and logical, you know, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna get into the debate of whether PG dump is technically a backup tool or is technically not a backup tool or is like uh, angrily not a backup tool. Um, I, I feel like it's safer to stay away from that. But you know, even, even if it were a backup tool, it's probably, it's safe to say that it's not a very good one, at least measured quantitatively along the lines of uh, the recovery point objective and the recovery time objective. Uh, compared to logical backups, physical backups give you uh, a better recovery point. Um, you can achieve a better reco recovery point objective and you also get continuous point in time recovery. You know, you can restore not just to like every, every two days on the dot for the past month, but all the time in between as well. Um, and in addition, just like as a performance uh, consideration, restores tend to be a lot faster with physical backups than with logical backups. So your recovery time objective is a lot better as well. And that brings us to the concept of super physical backups. Um, maybe there's a proper term for this that someone can shout at me at the end of this talk. Uh, but I basically took everything that is below the level of what Postgres even sees 
you know, file system or block device snapshots, whether that's ZFS, LVM, EBS, you know, Elastic Block Store on, on Amazon Cloud. Things like, there are some things like that that can take consistent snapshots of whatever they have um, at some moment of time. And I'd say that like that's certainly a possibility for you to use. Uh, some advantages of it even might be that if you use MySQL as well or a uh, collection of different databases and you want consistency in your backup solution for all of them, Super Physical is probably an option for you there. Uh, the main thing I'd point out though is that uh, physical, you know, just normal physical backups can be a little bit less fragile. Uh, for instance, if we, you know, if you've heard of the create table space command that lets you put some tables in one DB onto another physical disk, uh, you know, you, you might, you can instantly break your backup solution if you're not careful with something like that, if you're depending on super physical backups. Um, in addition, I'd point out that there is just better Postgres specific tooling for physical backups, and this is a very hard thing to roll yourself. So for that reason, the focus of my talk is on these physical backups, but super physical, it's an option as well. Um, I'm just not gonna touch very much on it. Monitoring. All right, so good monitoring is loud when it needs to be. Like something is broken, a human needs to intervene, someone needs to figure out how to fix it. But great monitoring is quiet the rest of the time. You know, yesterday at a talk, someone, um, you know, there was a quote from, there were some quotes from Brendan Gregg mentioned, and I'm gonna roughly paraphrase one of my favorite personally, which is that good monitoring or good debugging methodologies should not just identify when a system is broken. It also needs to exonerate, like if you really ha wanna have great monitoring, it needs to be able to exonerate a healthy system. Um, and by that I mean like it shouldn't have a high false positive rate. It should be providing more signal than noise. Okay, so on that theme, what are some ways to notice when restores are failing in the first place? Since this is, this is like what we actually care about this is, what, this is how we prove to ourselves that we don't have a Schrodinger's backup. We have a real macroscopic, real backup that we can use. Should we have alerts? Should we have dashboards? One strategy that has worked particularly well for us at Academia is just a Slack bot. Uh, you know, we use Slack, so if you're on Teams uh, or something else, just translate this to whatever you actually use. Uh, and it will just tell us when, uh, well, it tells us multiple things. One thing, it posts a message whenever a setup starts, uh, along with some metadata, like where is it, um, what environment is it in, what type of database is it, uh, and then it'll do one of three things. It'll either, uh, when it fails, if it's destined to fail, it'll tell us that it failed, or if it worked, it'll tell us that it worked, or we'll see nothing at all about, you know, we'll see nothing, no updates for long enough that someone gets suspicious and looks into it, like something must have crashed before it got to the point where it reported its progress. Um, another thing that I'd like to point out that I really like about this is that you can just like see, you can just see your recovery time right there. Like what is the recovery time you achieved? This one was 10 minutes because it's a QA instance. It basically doesn't have much of a data set at all. This is just uh, the time it takes to do all the other things we need to do, like install packages, Postgres included. Um, but to give an example of a production system, uh, this actually happened just yesterday. Um, so today was yesterday, you know, 3 p.m. Um, I noticed that we needed to replace um, a, well, a roughly 15 terabyte database. Uh, there had been some suspected degradation in its disk per in the disk performance of a node, so we decided to just bring up a replacement for it, and it completed around 9:17 p.m., six hours ish, give or take. All right. So let's think about digging a little bit deeper into the step-by-step -step process by which restores happen in Postgres though. Uh, so what happens with a physical restore is I divide this into roughly three stages. Um, we could maybe break it down a little bit more. Uh, but there is a stage where we are restoring, you know, the physical snapshot of the base directory, in our case from S3 onto disk. That takes some time. Um, you know, in this particular case, we were able to get roughly three terabytes per hour. Um, if you are also using S3 and you're also using, you know, streaming to like an EC2 instance and you're noticing you're not getting that despite the concurrency you set, 
One recommendation I would make is to check your disk throughput setting, especially if you're using GP3 volumes or similar. Um, but you know, moving on to stage two, what happens after that is it needs to pull wall, which hopefully is stored in the same place. Um, if any of those are missing, you might get one of those stage three boss fights where Postgres just never boots up because you actually don't have a backup at all. You have a bunch of different files. Um, you know, uh, you, you don't have a consistent snapshot of the base directory, regardless of like what tooling you used if you're missing any of these wall files. So it's gonna need to restore enough wall files to boot in the first place. And then depending on what you've configured a recovery target to, it's going to need to replay those wall from uh, your backup destination as well to catch up to the point where we can move on to stage three, which is we connect it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing the arrow as the direction in which like data flows with streaming replication when we connect this new node to uh, the existing uh, node that we wanna stream from, uh, whether that's the writer or some cascading setup, uh, but you know, the parameter is actually set like on the uh, subscribers side or the uh, you know the standby side uh, re uh, primary con info, and so in principle we want to maybe dig into monitoring each of these steps. How do we do that? Uh, disk usage is kind of useful for stage one. Um, you know, in Datadog, uh, which is what we use, I'll, I'll give some graphs from Datadog. Uh, translate it to whatever observability tooling you use if you don't use Datadog, um, but we get a uh, free disk right out of the box. Um, assuming the node's characteristics are consistent, you know, the new node's characteristics are consistent with the existing ones, uh, we can see that as it comes up, it starts with more free disk than it eventually ends up with. Um, if we're catching this like mid setup, we can kind of just extrapolate uh, to the point in time that we expect it to catch up, and then we're done with stage one. Um, in addition, another metric that we get just out of the box, we don't need to code anything custom, is a replication delay time metric. Uh, so we can just look at a graph and see these slopes, you know, these downward slopes, ideally downward. If they're going upward, that's a problem. Uh, but ideally downward slopes indicating when a new node has finally caught up and it's streaming continuously, it's at the same point in time as whatever it is following from. Um, in the, you know, in most cases our writer. And in addition to that, um, yeah. So like in addition to all of this, so one nice thing about all of that is that restores are what we actually care about and it's what we're actually measuring with all of those approaches. But the problem with that, the problem with just leaving it at that is that broken restores are fundamentally a lagging indicator of broken backups. So we may ask ourselves whether there are any leading indicators that we should monitor as another layer of Swiss cheese, so to speak, or as an optimization just to save us time in the future, just to make our system more resilient. Uh, so this one is a little bit PG backrest specific, but I assume, you know, I've never used Barman or WallG, but I assume they might have something similar to that, or maybe someone's built something on top of it that's similar to this, but uh, PG backrest has an info command. You can pipe it to head, and there is a status row that says okay or not okay. You know, we could say okay or maybe give you some information about an error. And this is really great for humans. You know, if you're writing automation around this, you should probably look into the JSON output option that PG Backrest has. But just like as a visual, I find that this is like a pretty good, you know, a pretty good illustration of a really easy check you could implement right now. Um, you might not get it like out of the box with Datadog's Postgres monitoring, but it's not the hardest check to write. Just check if the status is okay. Alert someone if not. Uh, similarly, if you pipe it to tail, you can get useful information such as when was the most recently recent backup taken? Um, I did not take this yesterday. I took this uh, about a week ago. So at the time, this was a little bit more recent than appears today. There's a lot of other useful metadata here as well. Like you get, um, you get, how much space is being taken. Um, I'm not gonna touch much on costs today for sake of time, but you should be able to cross correlate what is being reported from this tool to what you see in your cloud billing later. Also, um, on the theme of, you know, let's say we don't wanna just trust the tool that is supposed to be taking our backups to monitor itself for leading indicators. Like maybe there's some general notion of corruption we're worried about, or we just want like independent, uh, independent checks here to make sure that our backups are solid, um, we can check S3. 
what are we checking it for? Well, we can just check if anything is there at all. That's a good test generally. Um, there's like there's a bit of a directory structure that you expect to be here. We can maybe reverse engineer some of it. Um, I wouldn't get too complicated here. This is just defending against that level one boss fight earlier. Uh, is anything actually in S3 is a pretty simple check you can make. Um, in addition, wall archiving. I mentioned that the write ahead log not only gives us, is what gives us that power of physical backups, it is what gives physical backups its, um, you know, better characteristics compared to logical backups on recovery points you can achieve and recovery times you can achieve. But the downside of that is it is a point of failure. Like if you have a snapshot of PG data, um, the way Postgres backups work at a low level just depends on wall being present continuously. And if any of those are gone or if they're not getting sent to S3 or whatever your backup destination is for some reason or another, uh, that means your backups are broken. So, um, some nice things that you get out of the box with Datadog um, is you get archiving throughput. You can put it on a graph, uh, check, you know, I have it here split between different clusters, but if you zoom into one, um, a good sign would be that you see it non-zero uh, at all points of time. A bad sign would be if you see it just suddenly disappear, unless this is, unless you expect that. Like if you don't expect it to disappear, it's a bad sign if it disappears and you should look into it. Um, in addition, there is, an archiving failure metric that you get out of the box. Um, so you know we can hear we can see some blips here where some clusters apparently have been failing at least once, um, at least once every once in a while. And you know going back to the theme that I mentioned earlier that great monitoring should be quiet when it doesn't need to interrupt someone. We may ask the question like why why is this stat non-zero? Like isn't this bad? Isn't this something that should wake the dead in the middle of the night or you know, wake all the SREs at 2 a.m. if this is happening. Um, and I'm not gonna dive into the details of here. All I'm gonna say is like, you, you need to get a sense with whatever backup solution you're using of what is expected, what is anomalous, and what is just something you can ignore. In this case, there are some like weird edge cases you might run into if you are using asynchronous archiving um, as an option. If, you know, often you only need this if you are at a certain throughput or above, there are some weird things that can lock up with PG backrests implementation in particular. Um, you might not expect this with certain other tools. It's um, honestly probably a subject for a completely other talk if someone wanted to give it on the current status of asynchronous archiving capabilities with the way that Postgres is, has its archive command system set up. Um, but you know, to put it short, we don't alert on this. We alert, you know, we don't alert on like we, don't, we have not tuned our sensitivity of this alert to alert on every single instance where this fails. We have a threshold that we've tuned to balance the needs of uh, business needs for good backups that we can rely on, but also we value our developers, we value our members of the on-call rotation, we value not waking them up in the middle of the night and making their lives uh, unhappy. So, recap. Every time you need a replica, use your backups at least as you know, stage one of getting that replica into being. In addition to that, periodically test a cold restore in a QA or staging environment, particularly if you have a need for that to exist anyways, if you're doing some sort of test that would benefit from it. Um, on the theme of monitoring, you know, do as much as you can to visualize the restore process, especially if it doesn't have to involve actually alerting someone, actually interrupting someone. Um, you know, like that Slack channel, people who are interested can just join and see, and that works well enough for us. If you're provisioning, you know, if your throughput of how often you churn through replicas is three orders of magnitude more than us, that probably does not scale for you. You probably need some other solution or some alerting. So context is important um, in your organization. And last but not least, make sure your monitoring, you know, especially your alerting monitoring pulls its own weight. Um, and if you do all of this, Hopefully you have enough layers of Swiss cheese to keep your backups working well and keep your, you know, keep yourself sleeping well at night, not worrying about your data disappearing. A uh, brief list of acknowledgements. I'd like to acknowledge, you know, my employer for giving me this learning opportunity, especially with that old script and uh, helping me prioritize replacing it with more trusted tooling. Also my team who have sat through this presentation uh, several times as I practiced it for scale. 
Uh, in addition, Michael from, uh, you know, the founder of PG Mustard, uh, I practiced this talk with him last week. And regardless of what you thought about the delivery here today, um, I think it's safe to say I did a better job here than back then. And that's a wrap. Any questions? Biggest horror story. Um, related to well, I'd say that like that level three boss fight. Like I'm, I thought the backup was good. It, all of my tooling and scripting that I've written to check in S three, you know, doing everything I can that isn't literally testing the backup, testing a restore directly, and yet it still doesn't work. Like that's pretty scary. Although I'd say that like when I see empty files that have metadata saying they're good, that's pretty scary too. Um, yeah, I did run into an interesting, well, it, it's a little bit diverging from, you know, the subject of this talk when I, just in the process of migrating us from our built-in, you know, or our, our home-rolled backup solution to PG Backrest, um, we were using an archiver known as, uh, well, if you've heard of Wall-G, there was a predecessor to that called Wall-E that I think has fallen quite a bit out of fashion for a number of reasons, uh, but, you know, it worked for us at the time. Our, our Reco you know, our restore testing process, um, our restore testing process pretty much is what I would credit to it working since we'd have to make adjustments. But, you know, there are just a lot of pain points in moving one archiver to another. Like we had to replace what Wally -E was doing with what PG back, you know, with how PG backrest does its archiver process. And running two archivers at the same time is just pretty, it's pretty complicated. There are some bad things. I, I think there's like a ticket that I, I created a GitHub issue on, on Wally's GitHub, not, not because I expect anyone to fix, fix it. I think like the project is archived at this point, but just like for visibility, if anyone else is running into it. Um, effectively, it would, you know, it's, 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 like a, it's like a race condition if you're archiving quickly enough because of how each side is handling uh, asynchronous archiving that leaves like gaps in your wall record on the PG backrest side because Wally is like directly writing into the um, you know, arch you know, it's kind of writing to something that Postgres assumes it's not going to, but um, yeah, I don't have time to, <laughs> I pro probably don't have time for uh, this question, you know, Q&A section of the talk to get into all the details there, but, you know, I I'd certainly be happy to rant all about that uh, offline. Hand in the back, do you have a question? Oh, oh okay, What's alarm. Any questions? Oh, hold on. I'll bring it to the mic. Um, so the wall is constantly being backed up, or okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question, the question was like, is the wall being constantly backed up? Uh, yeah. Well, ideally, yes. Uh, it is. It's a thing that you have to monitor. Uh, one, one, you know, particular failure mode that one should be aware of when monitoring, like a Postgres backup and recovery system is is the you know is wall archiving falling behind since sometimes if postgres gets a lot of writes whatever is sending you know whatever process is supposed to be sending the write ahead log or you know wall se wall file segments as the terminology goes whatever is supposed to be sending those might just not be able to keep up temporarily you know usually and that's part of why i mentioned like our internal goal um, our internal like recovery point objective has a small allowance for a few seconds to a few minutes because sometimes you know we get a burst of writes and we have some things that have been committed on Postgres but have not made it into S3 yet. Uh, but yeah, more or less, you know, it's continuously being backed up, or at least it should. And if it's not, then there will be problems. How big are the segments? Can you repeat that? Oh yeah. How big are the uh, log file segments? Oh, the question was how big are the wall file segments? And honestly, I, I, so I think it's like a compile time option that you can, it's either a compile time option or like a grand unified config option that you can set. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's on, it's on the order of several megabytes. And that, you know, another thing to keep in mind is there tends to be like your archive, whatever process is doing the archiver tends to compress it beforehand with either Z standard or something else. Uh, so, you know, depending on like how much logical change is actually in there. On our QA systems, we'll see it ends up in S3 as like these tiny 
files with almost nothing in it because it just compressed so well and it's just been it's just been switching segments on like kind of a timer process or a scheduled process rather than because it needs to switch to one because so much has been written. Uh, but you know, it, it there shouldn't be too large, uh, to put it short. Any more questions? All right. All right. Well, Thank you for listening. Thank you.